This week our primary focus turns to studying topics regarding how electrochemical cells, otherwise known as battery cells, operate. And this is fundamental preparation for knowing how to use them optimally in an application. In this lesson, our objective is very quickly to introduce a lot of background terminology that will be absolutely critical throughout the rest of the specialization. It may seem like all we're doing is making a list of definitions, and in fact that's a big part of it, but doing so is necessary for us to come to a common language to be able to describe carefully and specifically everything that we study regarding battery cells and battery packs. In later lessons this week, you're going to learn qualitatively how battery cells function, and later we'll look at applications of these battery cells and so forth. So all of that is coming, but at this point we're not going to focus on that just yet. Even later in the specialization, in follow-on courses to this one, we're going to do uh, go into much more depth quantitatively, and to do so we will develop mathematical sets of equations known as models for even greater understanding of how battery cells work. We start at the very beginning with a definition of a cell. A cell is the smallest electrochemical unit. A cell delivers a voltage that can be used to power a load, and that voltage depends on the chemistry used to build this cell. Some cells are designed to be used only one time and then recycled. Others are designed to be rechargeable. Uh, the single-use cells are referred to as primary cells, and rechargeable cells are referred to as secondary cells. If we're being technical and careful and precise with our terminology, then it is important to note that a cell is different from a battery. Technically, a battery comprises more than one cell somehow connected together. Uh, oftentimes, in common use, though, people use the term cell and battery interchangeably. I will try to be careful in this specialization to refer to the individual unit as a cell, uh, or sometimes as a battery cell. And when I'm referring instead to connected cells, I will refer to that as a battery or a battery pack. If we connect individual cells together, we build what is known as a battery or a battery pack. It doesn't matter whether the cells are wired together in series or in parallel. A battery pack comprises cells wired either in series or parallel, or even in some combination of series and parallel. Batteries are sometimes packaged in a single physical unit. For example, the standard automotive 12 volt lead acid battery is built from six 2 volt lead acid cells wired in series inside of a single package. Sometimes high capacity lithium ion cells are in fact batteries because internal to the packaging multiple smaller cells happen to be wired together in parallel. So it's not always possible simply to look at the package and know whether it is a cell or whether it is a battery. In a high capacity battery pack such as the ones that we focus on in the specialization, there will often be dozens or even hundreds of individual battery cells that are wired together and that wiring is usually then external to the cells. And large bus bars or thick wires connect the cells together in order to be able to carry the high electrical currents needed by the application. When we draw an electrical circuit that includes either a cell or a battery, we use schematic symbols to represent the cells and the batteries in the circuit diagram. The image that's on the right of the slide shows these schematic symbols for both a cell and for a battery. Notice that the symbol for a battery looks kind of like two cell symbols connected together, uh, but this specific symbol for a battery is used without change regardless of how many cells are actually connected together. The voltage of a battery depends on the combination of active chemicals or active materials that are used inside of the cells. As you will learn in the specialization, the voltage of a battery cell changes depending on whether it's fully charged or whether it's completely discharged or at some point in between. Uh, however, we need some kind of a voltage label to put on the cell when we market it and sell it, 
Uh, so we have some kind of an idea of what the voltage range is of this cell that we're working with. So we define something called a nominal voltage, which is a typical voltage or maybe an average voltage of a battery cell. And it's somewhere between the fully charged voltage of a cell and a fully discharged voltage of a cell. For many single use or primary battery cells, this voltage is around 1.2 volts. For example, standard alkaline battery cells or dry cells have voltage of 1.2 volts. Even some rechargeable or secondary cells have a similar voltage. Um, for secondary battery cells that have nickel-based chemistries like nickel cadmium or nickel metal hydride, the voltage is often around 1.2 to 1.5 volts. Most lithium-based cells have a nominal voltage of over 3 volts. And this is true whether it's a single-use primary lithium-based cell or whether it's a rechargeable secondary lithium-based cell. The photograph on the right side of the slide shows an example lithium-ion cell from a mobile phone. If we zoom in on this image, we can see that the nominal voltage of this cell is printed directly on the packaging. And in fact, this is quite commonly done, especially with cells for consumer electronics applications. And if you look carefully, you can see that this particular cell has a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts. And as I've already mentioned, the nominal voltage is a kind of an average voltage or a typical voltage. The voltage of the cell at any point in time will be different from this nominal voltage. It could be higher or it could be lower depending on how the battery cell has been used uh, over the past. Another important term to understand when talking about battery cells is the capacity of the battery cell, sometimes called the total capacity or total charge capacity. And either way of thinking about it, there are slight distinctions between what is meant by those terms, but the capacity is trying to specify a quantity of charge that the cell is rated to hold. Now, if you want to be precise and technical, the metric unit for charge is coulombs. But coulombs are very awkward units to work with when analyzing circuits. And they're also very small units of charge. And even a small battery cell would usually hold many thousands of coulombs of charge. So instead of coulombs, which is the same thing as ampere times seconds, capacity is specified often in terms of amperes times hours or milliampers times hours instead. And we call that ampere hours and milliampere hours, or sometimes we are a little bit um, imprecise and we call it amp hours and milliamp hours. Uh, if a battery cell has a capacity of one ampere hour, then a fully charged cell can deliver one ampere of current for the period of one hour before it is fully discharged. Again, on this example picture of a battery cell, we see that its capacity is listed as 1,900 milliampere hours. Another way of saying it is 1.9 ampere hours. And note that the quantity that is printed on the package is once again a nominal quantity. At the beginning of life, most battery cells will actually have slightly higher capacity than what is printed on the package. And over life, for various reasons that you will learn about, the capacity will decrease. And for secondary battery cells, we usually consider them to have reached the end of life when their capacity is only 70% of the original capacity. That is, when the cell has lost 30% of its capacity. Electrical current is measured in amperes, or if we're being a little less precise, we might say amps. Uh, but the impact of one ampere of current to a small battery cell is quite different from the impact of one ampere of current to a large battery cell. So it's nice to have a relative measure of electrical current that is somehow scaled to the size of a battery cell. And this relative measure is known as the C rate. The C rate of a battery cell is the level of constant current charge or discharge that the cell can sustain for one hour of time. For example, a cell having a capacity of 20 ampere hours should be able to deliver 20 amperes of current for one hour or two amperes of current for 10 hours. Uh, this relationship, as you'll find out, especially in the second course in the specialization, is not a completely linear relationship. It's not quite that simple, but it's a pretty close relationship. It's a good approximation. 
So when we say that the cell should be able to deliver 20 amperes of current for one hour, we are saying that the C rate of a 20 ampere hour cell is 20 amperes. It's what we call the 1C rate. In this example, 2 amperes is what we would call the C divided by 10 rate because it is one tenth of the 1C rate. To compute the C rate of a battery cell from its nominal capacity, you simply write out the capacity together with its units, which might be 20 AH, where the A is for ampere and the H is for hour. And then you take your eraser and you erase the H, and we are left with 20 A, or 20 amperes. So ampere hours becomes amperes, and milliampere hours becomes milliamperes. If we start with a fully charged battery cell and we discharge the cell at a 10C rate, the cell will be completely discharged in about six minutes. In the photograph to the right, you can see the same battery cell that I uh, showed you on the previous slide. Remember we said that the nominal capacity of this cell is 1.9 ampere hours. Uh, so therefore the 1C rate of the cell is 1.9 amperes. Or if you want to put it a different way, the nominal capacity is 1,900 milliampere hours, and so the 1C rate is 1,900 milliamperes. We use battery cells because they store energy that we can later release in controlled ways to do work. Uh, there are multiple ways to store energy, of course, and a battery cell stores this energy in an electrochemical form. Before the end of this course, you will learn how to compute the energy stored in a battery cell quite precisely. But for now, it's sufficient to know that the total energy storage capacity of a cell is approximately its nominal voltage multiplied by its nominal capacity. Uh, the units for energy are then either watt hours or possibly milliwatt hours uh, if we're talking about a small battery cell. Uh, it could even be kilowatt hours if we're talking about a large battery pack. In the cell that I have been using in an example, you can compute the nominal energy storage capacity by multiplying its nominal voltage of 3.7 volts by its nominal capacity of 1.9 ampere hours and find that its energy capacity is 7.03 watt hours. Energy and power are different things. Uh, power is the rate at which we release energy from a battery cell. It's the rate at which the energy is used. Power is measured then either in milliwatts or in watts or even sometimes in kilowatts. When battery cells are connected in series, the voltage of the battery pack is the sum of the individual cell voltages. However, the battery capacity is equal to the individual cell capacity. The reason for this is if the cells are connected in series, the same electrical current must pass through one cell as passes through all of the other cells. So all of the cells are charged and discharged at the same rate. For example, consider the battery that I've drawn to the right of this slide constructed from three cells where each cell has a nominal voltage of 3 volts and each has a nominal capacity of 20 ampere hours. The nominal voltage of this battery will be 9 volts because we are summing together 3 plus 3 plus 3, uh, 3 volts from each of three cells. The nominal capacity of the battery pack will be 20 ampere hours because each one of the cells has a capacity of 20 ampere hours. So notice that all of the cells, that if all of the cells start fully charged and we pass 20 amperes of current through this battery pack for one hour, that same current passes through all three cells, and so all three cells will be discharged after one hour. We can also compute the nominal energy capacity of this battery. The energy is simply the sum of the energy stored in each one of the cells. So we compute the energy as 3 volts multiplied by 20 amp hours multiplied by three cells to give us the final answer of 180 watt hours. When battery cells are connected in parallel to make a battery pack, the battery voltage is now equal to the voltage of the individual cells. However, the battery capacity is now the sum of the individual cell capacities. And this is because the battery current is the sum of all the cell currents, 
or to think about it another way, the battery current is divided among all of the cells, and so each cell sees only a fraction of the total current. And so um, if I were to take a battery cell having a 20 amp hour capacity uh, and put it in a battery pack with multiple cells in parallel, uh, less, and then I put 20 amps through the battery pack, less than 20 amps would go through that one cell, and so it would not be discharged in one hour. So for example, consider the battery pack that I've drawn on this slide. And this battery is constructed from so five cells connected in parallel. Each cell has a nominal voltage of 3 volts and a nominal capacity of 20 ampere hours, just like on the previous slide. Kirchhoff's voltage law says that electronic components, including battery cells that are connected in parallel, must share the same voltage. Therefore, this battery pack will have a nominal voltage of 3 volts, which is the voltage of any one of the cells. The nominal capacity of this battery pack will be the sum of the capacities of the individual cells. Maybe you can see it more easily now that I've drawn this diagram. The total battery current is the sum of the currents passing through each one of the cells. So for every ampere hour of current that flows through the battery pack, only one-fifth of that current flows through each one of the cells. Since the capacity of each cell in this diagram uh, is 20 ampere hours, then the capacity of the battery pack must be five times that, or 100 ampere hours. Uh, put another way, if the battery starts fully charged and 100 amperes of current flows, then 20 amperes of current flows through each one of the cells, and this can be sustained for one hour before the battery pack is discharged. The nominal energy capacity of the battery pack is equal to 5 cells multiplied by 3 volts per cell multiplied by 20 ampere hours, which results in a total energy of 300 watt hours. So to summarize what you've learned in this lesson, a cell is the smallest electrochemical storage unit. Primary cells are not rechargeable and secondary cells are rechargeable. Cells have a nominal or a typical voltage and have a nominal or typical charge storage capacity. The C rate is a way of normalizing electrical current uh, according to a cell's nominal capacity. Cells store energy that can later be released to do work and the rate at which this energy is released is called power. We make batteries by connecting cells in series and or in parallel. And finally, we can compute battery nominal voltage and nominal capacity and nominal energy ratings by knowing how the individual cells are connected.